Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well on this sunny day. Um, my name is Stephanie Stombach, and I am with the child nutrition team. And today we're going to talk about accountability in the National School Lunch Program and School Breakfast Program. Um, accountability is one of the most important aspects of running a school nutrition program. It's important um, when filing your claims, and we also look at it during administrative reviews. Um, so that's why we are talking about it today. Um, so just wanted to send a reminder that this training is being recorded and it will be posted on our webpage at a later time. Um, and we will also take questions at the end. So if you have any questions as we go along, please enter those in the Q&A box. All right, so let's get started. Um, so here are some learning objectives for the training. So hopefully at the end of the webinar, um, you will be able to answer the following um, and understand the importance of accountability in the operation of your school nutrition program. Know the different methods of accountability and the pros and cons of each and then take steps to improve accountability in your operation based on common review findings. So here's our agenda. Um, first, we'll start with a refresher on counting and claiming reimbursable meals. Um, then we'll go into the different accountability methods, including electronic and manual, and we'll review the pros and cons of each. And then we'll end with common accountability issues with reviews and um, how to go about approving this in your own operation. All right, so before we dig in, um, I wanted to include some, some definitions that we'll be using throughout the presentation and are um, really important to understand. Um, the first one is what a reimbursable meal is. Of course, this is at the core of child nutrition programs um, and is very important when it comes to counting meals correctly and making sure that only reimbursable meals are counted. Um, so this is a meal that's served to a student that meets the meal pattern requirements um, and it qualifies for reimbursement with federal and state funds. And the point of service, um, and this one that if, if there's anything you're gonna take away from the training today, it's what point of service means. Um, and this is the point in the food service operation where a determination can be made that a reimbursable meal has been served um, to a eligible child. And we'll talk more about that. And then the other um, definition is alternate meal service location. So this means anywhere outside your typical food service area, um, or usually cafeteria, um, where meals are counted. So this typically um, involves classrooms, hallways, and grab and go stations. All right, so we are gonna start with a quick review of counting and claiming reimbursable meals. So to be eligible for reimbursement, um, the following have to be met. So the first one is the meal must meet meal pattern requirements. This both includes the offered meal, so what's, what was on the menu for that day, and then what students select. So what they select for a reimbursable meal, um, making sure they have three components on their tray, one being a fruit or vegetable. So that has to be met. Then the second one is meals are counted at the point of service or when a student actually takes a meal. And then the third, bullet here is only one reimbursable meal is allowed per student per day. Um, this includes um, breakfast and lunch, so only one meal is allowed per day. So it's making sure that there are steps in place to make sure that duplicate meals um, are not possible. And then point of service. Um, so this means that Meals can only be counted at the point when a student receives a reimbursable meal. Um, we typically see this with, um, well, I should say this includes field trips 
meals brought to the classroom in alternate serving locations. So making sure that um, meals are only counted at the point of service. All right, so let's talk about some unacceptable meal counting procedures. Um, and if you were lucky enough to attend our new director boot camp, you got to see some of the staff participate in a skit on why some of these methods are unacceptable. And sometimes it can be hard to kind of um, visualize why um, some accountability methods and some don't. Um, so it's helpful to kind of see it in practice um, and drives home the point of why things are allowed and not allowed. Um, so these were some of the um, skits that we did um, and would be considered unallowable uh, meal counting methods. The first one is tray counts. Um, so this is when the number of trays are counted before meal service and then the number left over. So the difference is the reimbursable count. Seems like easy way to do it. But in reality, trays could have um, gone to adults. Um, maybe there was a drop tray um, and maybe even some students didn't have reimbursable meals, which we know happens um, where you have certain kids that just won't take what they need um, to be reimbursable. So these are some reasons why tray counts would not be allowed. Um, the next one is attendance counts in classroom or head counts. We see this a lot. Um, and just because a student is in attendance doesn't mean that they actually took a reimbursable meal. They could have left early or maybe they just didn't want a complete meal. So, so those counts are not allowed. Um, counting meals before a student receives their meal. Um, so this is why the point of service is at the end of the serving line so that that point of service, that determination that it's a reimbursable meal is the last step in the, the process. Um, and we don't see this, this as often during reviews, but just wanted to make sure to send a reminder about this one. Um, another example is incomplete and second meals. Um, again, you have a student that comes through the line they don't want everything, or maybe they just want a milk only, um, that would not be considered a reimbursable meal. <clears throat> um, so what I would encourage is uh, site visits in your schools um, to make sure that meal counts are being done correctly, especially if you have breakfast in the classroom, a pre-K program, or other alternate serving locations, um, to make sure that things are being done correctly and that staff are trained because what you might assume is happening and what is actually happening could be two different things. So um, be sure to get out into your schools and see, see how meal counting is being done. All right, so let's dive into the different accountability methods. Um, and I just wanted to kind of start off this conversation with, um, you know, this is just information for you to have. One accountability system isn't better than another. So it really is up to you to decide what's gonna work best um, in your program. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the electro electronic point of service or POS. Um, we commonly um, see this used in schools operating a traditional program where they're collecting free and reduced applications and tracking individual status um, because eligibility is still needed with that program. Um, so it seems to work well if you are tracking meals based on free, reduced, and paid. However, we also see it with CEP schools and CEP is community eligibility provision as well as provision to schools. Um, and this is because um, there are other features of the, the computer system, um, such as tracking a la carte sales um, or just liking the reports that the system will generate for you. So some advantages of the electronic POS, 
um, is it is good for tracking a la carte sales. So if you have a middle school or a high school that sells a la carte items, this might be a good option for you if you want to find um, a way to track it in an easier way. Um, another advantage is it will generate some meal count reports for you, which is helpful for filing your claim and during administrative reviews because we do ask um, for a lot of meal count information for the month or by day. Um, so it's easy to, to get that information. And I'll show you an example of a report um, that, that you could use. Um, but a con would be that there is a cost associated with it. Um, there will be a startup cost and then annual fees or annual renewals. Um, so depending on if it's part of your food service budget and you have the funds um, for an electronic system, um, that's another factor to consider. I know that um, in the past, some schools have had grant funds um, to purchase um, electronic POS, um, such as with alternative breakfast models. So that's um, something else to look into. So here's an example of a report that um, the electronic POS can generate for you. This one is from NutriKids and um, it's called the monthly claims report. Um, it could be something completely different in another system, um, but I just wanted to point out, so in the middle of the screen, there's an attendance factor um, and this is what you would enter to make sure that your meal counts don't exceed attendance or um, attendance adjusted um, meal counts for that day. So there is a built-in edit check um, and edit checks are required, whether you use a, an electronic system or a manual system. Um, so that is helpful with electronic POS. On the left-hand side, um, you'll see school breakfast program. And then um, this is a monthly claim report. So you'll see the date from one through the end of the month. And then if you go across, um, so for example, on the first day of the month, you see free reduced and paid or full price and then a total for the day. And then it will tally up your meals each month. So there's daily and monthly information. Um, and then on the right hand side is the school lunch program and it has the same information um, for daily and monthly meal counts. Um, so that's an advantage of um, an electronic POS. Um, and like I said, if you have an a la carte program, um, there, I believe there are some reports that will generate your a la carte sales. Um, and then the items that you sell where you can add um, a price to each one and can kind of track, okay, what, what are kids buying for a la carte? Um, so it does have benefits beyond just tracking reimbursable meals. All right, the next method we're gonna talk about is a roster or checklist. Um, we've seen this used across all programs, whether you're traditional, provision two, base year, or CEP. Um, and for provision two, base year, because um, that's when you're collecting free and reduce applications, you would wanna use a checklist um, or electronic point of service. Um, but typically this is used to track students by name so that you can um, track free, reduced and paid status for compiling your claim. And we also see this commonly used with pre-K classrooms, um, which is an alternative meal serving location um, because that seems to work well. Um, and you might only have one or two classrooms. Um, so we see that commonly being done. Um, some advantages of a checklist are ease of use and also training. Um, if you 
need someone to do the checklist or you need a backup person, it's very easy to train them. Um, and we commonly see teachers or other staff um, doing the checklist, um, but you would wanna make sure that whoever is doing it has been trained and they know how to determine reimbursable meals. One con of a checklist is that it can be time consuming with filing your claim um, and also is more prone to error compared to an electronic system. Um, even though that's not to say that, you know, electronic systems are foolproof, but um, because it is a manual process, it can take more time to calculate meal counts by status. And I've seen some schools will enter the information from the checklist into a spreadsheet. And anytime you're transposing numbers, there's more potential for error. So just a few things um, to keep in mind, but still definitely um, a good option. So let's talk more about al alternate meal serving locations. So um, remember that this is a location where um, it's outside of the cafeteria where meals are served and counted. And really the most important thing to remember is counted. So if you have kids that are coming to the cafeteria getting counted and then they go back to their classroom, they're still being counted in the cafeteria. So sometimes there we get questions on that. Um, so we commonly see this with breakfast in the classroom, pre-K classrooms, field trips. Um, so just wanted to remind everyone that attendance counts and then classroom or head counts are not at point of service. Um, and to just make sure if you do have alternate serving locations to just check these and make sure that they're being done at the point of service. And also make sure that your staff understands what point of service means as well. All right, the last one we're gonna talk about is a tick sheet, which is everyone's favorite because they are easy and simple to use. Um, so a tick sheet can only be used if, if you have any CEP schools or provision to non-base year. And this is because you're not tracking um, based on eligibility, you're just doing a total count um, for the meals served. Um, so no individual eligibility is required, um, but please make sure again that the meals are being done at point of service. Um, and so what we've seen with summer reviews more often um, than other programs is that we'll see a teacher or someone else um, right there at the beginning of the serving line when kids are waiting to get their tray, checking them off as before they even get their meal. So this, this would not be allowed. Um, so again, making sure that staff are trained and understand that it has to be at the end of the line. Um, so the advantage is it's the quickest and simplest method. The line goes faster, which um, most people are happy about and teachers are happy about. Um, the one drawback is you could inadvertently count students twice, especially if you have um, more than one meal service line or one more than one point of service, because you could have a student go to both lines and your staff might not realize that. And if you have David as a reviewer, he will do a test and see if that student, if there's the potential for that student to go to the other line. So make sure that this can't happen. And again, really the big takeaway is know what's happening in your schools and making sure that um, everyone knows what's allowed and what isn't allowed. All right, so let's talk about accountability issues during reviews. 
So these are some common findings that we come across during reviews. So inaccurate meal counts on the claim. Typically, we see it, that it's due to human error. There might be a one-time error that happens. So for example, your enrollment at the one school is 150 students. And on that day, we see that 170 meals were claimed. We're gonna question that. And then also that shows that your edit checks are not working in your system. So sometimes it's due, it's a one-time human error or maybe it's an issue with your POS. Maybe it went down in the middle of lunch service, which can happen. Um, or it could be a systemic problem um, where it just, you might need to look into another um, computer system. Another um, area that we've seen is lack of training for the person at point of service. So if you have um, a non-school nutrition staff, um, and even if they're your staff as well, make sure that they are trained and also retrained. So I would recommend training at the beginning of the school year and then halfway through the school year. And the site reviews, um, if you have more than one building, are due February 1st. So that's another good opportunity to make sure that um, people have been trained. And it's important to note that they're the last point in the serving line and they do have a very important job and they need to understand what, how important their job is. Um, and also lack of training can cost the district money because if we come in and do a review and we see three kids that co go by without a fruit or a vegetable, those meals won't be able to be claimed. And then the last two that I've listed here are the most common ones that we see. So attendance, head counts for pre-K meals, or breakfast in the classroom. Um, and again, this really comes down to monitoring, retraining, make sure everyone knows their job. And then also making sure there's communication between those classrooms and the kitchen just to make sure that everyone understands their role because they might say, oh, well, I thought the kitchen was gonna do this or sometimes there can be confusion with who's doing what. Um, and then the last one that, um, this is what we've seen the, the most, um, especially this school year, and we know that it happens, is that staff are taking meals for students in special programming without the student present so it could be due to a safety concern or behavioral issue um, and a teacher comes to get a meal uh, for a student to bring back to the classroom. Um, but remember the point of service definition is that it's the point of the operation where you can accurately um, tell that a meal has been served to an eligible child. And so it, we have to verify that it actually is going to the, the child um, to make sure that we can count it as a meal. So what do you do if this happens in your school and how do you address it? Because we know that sometimes it can be a tricky situation to navigate. So the most, the first and most ideal solution would be to have the student come to the cafeteria during a quiet time to select a meal, or maybe, maybe this is a few minutes before everyone else comes down um, and they can, they can select something and then, and then go back to the classroom and eat. Um, I've heard of one school that used the summer food service program to integrate the, um, the child in, in the school lunch setting. Um, so this, is, this might be an option for you and it might be a way to get them more comfortable of being in the lunchroom. Um, and so that um, it's something that can more easily be a regular occurrence. Um, 
So that's the first first um, option. The second one is to have food service staff bring the meal to the child and then check them off. Uh, this can take your staff away from the kitchen and um, takes additional staff time. So that's a that's another consideration. And then the last option and what I would consider least ideal is to have the teacher pick up the meal. And then once it's delivered, either check off the student and then bring the list to the kitchen. Um, there could also be a shared Google Doc um, where the student can be checked off that is shared with the kitchen and the, the teachers. Um, and it's least ideal because it's not a school nutrition employee and it does leave the responsibility on someone else. Um, but those are three options to consider. And if you have a situation where you need to talk through it, feel free to call one of us um, at the child nutrition office and we can help you troubleshoot. All right, so here are some observations and recommendations on accountability in general. Um, so the first one um, is lack of efficiency with the meal counting system. We have definitely come across this and um, just want to make sure that, um, you know, whatever meal counting system you choose is efficient. Um, you and your staff's time is valuable. So if you have a system that's not efficient, it's gonna be more time consuming for all involved and lead to more problems. And this is both just day-to-day -day issues having to troubleshoot as well as coming or us uh, going to your school during a review and coming across issues. Um, so my recommendation would be if you have an electronic POS system to use it to its full potential and really know which reports can be generated to make your life easier and your staff's life easier and contact the customer service um, company um, to um, ask them um, how which reports they have available. Um, the size of the school might determine whether you go electronic or use a manual system. For example, an elementary school with 40 kids versus a high school with 500 students would um, obviously um, have an impact on which system you go with. Um, if you're a small school, a roster or checklist might be the easiest and cost-effective method but at the same time, maybe you would prefer an electronic POS so that you can um, generate those reports and, and um, have those available for filing your claim and during reviews. For um, my recommendation for um, the electronic POS would be to make sure that it's compatible with school nutrition because not all systems are and that it does what you need. Um, and we've come across some, some schools that are using a system that's not built for school nutrition and is truly not working for them. Um, and if it's not doing what you need, then change it, see, see what other options you have. Um, and to make sure to do your research and really know the pros and cons of, of the different options. Um, if you have an electronic system and you're having to do things manually, that defeats the purpose of having an electronic system. Um, and I've seen um, some directors post on the listserv um, on different systems and feedback on um, different POS systems. So I think this is a great way to use the listserv um, and to just talk with your fellow directors to see what their experience has been and um, and you know, see if that might work for you. And like I said, no system is better than the other. It's just what is gonna work best for you and your schools. Um, and as always, if you have questions, um, 
reach out to our office and we have our number and, and this is our general email as well, but you can reach any of um, the team by going to our contacts um, section of our webpage. So that concludes the presentation, but we're gonna take some questions. So again, if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A box. Paul is telling me we don't have any questions yet. So we'll give it a few more seconds and see if anyone thinks of anything. All right, I guess it was clear as day. Oh, okay, <laughs> we got one. I will reach out to you on that question. Okay. All right, Paula will get back to Danielle about the child nutrition listserv, which hopefully everyone is a part of. All right, great. Well, thank you all for joining me this afternoon. And um, again, if you have any questions, um, in the meantime, feel free to reach out to any one of the child nutrition members um, and hope everyone has a great uh, rest of your afternoon. Take care.